Hello! Welcome to Security Cryptography Whatever. I'm Deirdre. I'm David. Uh, I'm Thomas. <laughs> and we are here again with part two of our chat with Nate Lawson. Hi, Nate. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. Who wants to summarize what we talked about last time? <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> I think we were like starting with the idea that pretty much all of modern cryptography is somehow traceable to Nate Lawson. Mm. <laughs> and then we talked about Nate's weird background and how it might have come to pass that that was the case. Mm -hmm. Did we settle on a CryptoPals connection? Because there is a direct connection from CryptoPals to the security class that is currently taught at the University of Michigan, because I was nothing if not lazy in grad school and reappropriated some of its content <laughs> for a variety of the projects, including E equals three and padding oracles. I feel like the major Nate to modern cryptography connection is through Tai Duong. And mm. I say that because Tai was working with Juliano Rizzo on the beast attack, like kind of roughly before he joined Matasano, which is the consulting firm I was running in like the mid 2000s, right? That was before CryptoPals. But he had joined us because of, I think, blog posts that we had written with Nate Lawson on the Mozilla E3 RSA attack. And I think probably the CBC padding Oracle thing. Um, and, and then CryptoPals happens. Um, and then CryptoPals gets you, I guess, to some extent, you and then also people like Filippo Valsorda. Um, I don't know how credible any of this is, right? Because <laughs> Tai Duong and Juliana Rizzo would have done amazing things with or without a blog post that, uh, that Nate inspired. But I'll, I'll make the connection anyways. <laughs> Thanks. I, I think they stand well on their own. We have to say that, but I don't, I don't know how true it is. <laughs> All right. So last time, I think we kind of left off with uh, Sony, which I don't know, we'll call this mid to late 2000s. So what comes next? Uh, yeah. So timeline wise, um, I left cryptography research in 2007 um, and started my own consulting company, Root Labs. And the real focus I was going after was this combination of embedded security crypto systems and what I call kernel or reverse engineering, which was just like any low level software that needs to talk crypto and work with devices. Right. And it was kind of fun because in constrained systems like embedded systems, you get to have very few resources, but you have challenging problems. Like, for example, the attacker is holding your device in their hand. <laughs> You've got kind of a, a little cheat code there, which is that a lot of the security things start on desktop software or server software. So, yeah. you know, if you're talking about memory corruption protections or things like that, that kind of starts on the server side or, or the, the browser side and gets deployed there first when you've got lots of CPU, lots of RAM, yeah. et cetera. And then you've still got these old systems where it's using like 1990 C code and not so secure. And so you can make a big difference with just bringing the same ideas downstream to, to embedded devices. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so I launched a consulting company. I hired a couple people and my, my approach to hiring was always like, just go to college campuses, offer to give a guest lecture on crypto. <laughs> and then whoever sort of sits in the front and pays attention, you know, <laughs> offer, offer jobs to. So holy uh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> it, it generally worked okay. Like uh, people who were actually asking questions and engaged, you know, were interested and, and it was kind of like an internship as well. It wasn't quite a full position, but um, that was a lot of fun. And we got to review a lot of systems, uh, kind of a continuation of the style of work at cryptography research and design some systems. This is roughly the same time when you were working on the toll systems, right? Like that was, yeah. you, you did that while you were at Root Labs. The, the, the toll system thing is fun. You should, you should tell us about the toll system thing. I, I want to hear the, I want to hear the toll system story. I have no idea about this story. So this is like, great. Are we talking about like turnpikes here? Kind of like that. Yeah, it was, it was a, it was a fun thing. <laughs> so uh, in the Bay Area, there's something called Fast Track. It's called Fast Pass in other parts of the country, yeah. things like that, and they have different systems. And this is an interesting connection between like embedded systems and that you have got these transponders in each car and also the poles, the light poles that transmit the signal to the car. Yeah. And then you've also got governments and regulations involved here because there's all these things yeah. about, you know, traffic laws and, mm -hmm. and regulation of how much money you can collect and how they do it and stuff like that. And 
not really a big focus on privacy at the time. Hmm. Um, maybe it's gotten better since then. It's been been a while. Hopefully, it's gotten better. Maybe cell phone tower location has actually become the bigger problem nowadays. Nowadays, <laughs> but uh, what I did was I just decided to take apart a fast track transponder. I, I'd never actually used them, but I was less like, I wonder how these are built. So yeah. pulled it apart. Found the MSP430. So there's your link to micro corruption as far as the MSP430 <laughs> being the processor for that. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so the MSP430 is a really power efficient processor, uh, kind of funky instruction set. But um, yeah, so I opened it up, um, tried to dump, jump, dump the flash from it. And sure enough, like the one I had was actually unlocked. Um, so I got a flash image off of it. I got several transponders though, and some of them were locked. And, um, you know, Chris Tarnowski. Uh, was able to using like a laser zap the fuse on it and um, <laughs> unlock it so the flash could be read off it. <laughs> so was that a laser at Root Labs? Did you do you have a laser? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I don't do any real real physical security stuff. Mostly just board level work of like you know soldering to to surface mount. That is about the extent I go to. All right. No, no fuming nitric acid in, in my office <laughs> yet. <laughs> but Chris was great at that stuff. And uh, yeah, he was able to just um, really quickly knock the MSP430 fuse out. So anyways, we looked, got the um, firmware and I started reverse engineering it. And I got to do something really fun, which I was going on vacation. So I printed out the entire firmware listing because I think it was like, 8k or something it's pretty small this is what you do on your vacation <laughs> <laughs> it's like a it's like a crossword puzzle you know you've got an assembly <laughs> listing and a pencil and a pool and you sit there by the pool oh and you, you mark up the assembly language listing with pencil i found a bunch of interesting things about the protocol it used <laughs> and and how it worked it's kind of a neat thing because the they, they want to be low power and then make the battery last almost forever yeah, yeah. so it doesn't actually transmit. Instead, what it does is it changes the polarization of an antenna <gasps> in the device to bounce back reflections to, to talk in the reverse channel so that it gets transmitted stuff and it gets a carrier wave and it, it modulates the carrier wave back to the Clever. transmitter to respond. Yeah. Wait, hold on. I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you right there. You got that from a paper printout of the raw assembly listing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, mean, I looked at the board, too. You know, I, I, saw, yeah, okay. I had photos of the board. So, yeah. So I could see like how the how the antenna was set up and stuff like that on the boards. It was just PCB traces. Anyway, so I soldered a bunch of wires to it. My my Black Hat presentation had like a picture of that on the front cover in order to be able to trace all the signals of my oscilloscope and things like that. And uh, so I just played around with it a little bit. But on vacation, I found that there looked like there was actually an exploitable stack overflow in this. So it had a message that was not really fully implemented. So they had a switch statement that was handling all the different messages and one of them was like an update process. And I think they were using this maybe even in the factory for programming the board oh. uh, with a serial number or something like that. I'm not really sure exactly what they're using it for. But anyways, it had this reserve protocol um, message that would, when you send it, it would like do an update, but it wasn't really well written. So it was supposed to have like a bounds check on the update, but it was, I think they had a sign extension bug or something like that in the, the length check. And so you could actually send it an update with an incorrect length count <laughs> and it would overwrite areas of flash that included the no, code area. No. So you can now get code execution on oh, this no. thing. And I was just like, okay, wow, this is crazy. So you can just like sit by the side of the road with an antenna and automate a little box and like reprogram everybody's transponder <gasps> to different serial numbers. You could reprogram the code and have code execution on it if you want, if you want to do something funky with that. Free tolls. Um, <laughs> yeah, free tolls. You know, give everyone the same one, two, three, four ID. So you can't really disable it because everybody's transponder is not or get to recall. So it's pretty crazy. And so I wrote a blog post about this. I got a black hat talk and I had offered, you know, I knew that the, the um, transit agencies probably were going to be not very happy to hear about this, <laughs> mm -hmm. given how many millions of these things they had deployed. Yeah. And I wasn't getting paid for it anyways. It was just a fun side project. So I didn't want to get into a heavy, like vulnerability disclosure kind of mm -hmm. situation where I'm spending hours and hours trying to help someone fix their assembly lines mm -hmm. of this thing. I just want to like give them information, hopefully get them to fix it. But of course, there had to be some disclosure. Otherwise, they weren't going to fix it at all. They're mm -hmm. just going to sit on it. So I, I talked actually to some local news programs and things like that. And they did some video on it. And of course, the MTA was like saying, oh, yeah, this is no big deal. You know, it's, it takes a really sophisticated person to exploit this. And I'm like, yeah, once you know the bug, it's not that hard to exploit. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one shot, one way. You just transmit it, broadcast it at a freeway. And yeah. you, you, you got all the cars owned at that point. Yeah. So, yeah, so it kind of went back and forth and they just kind of, I think, sat on it. It died down. I don't know if they ever actually fixed it. I offered to help them like 
show up and give them a talk and explain the problem and, and walk them through the code so that their vendor could fix it. But uh, they never took me up on it. So mm. that's kind of where it ended up. <laughs> mm-hmm. I didn't get sued, though, which is great. That is great because there have been other like mm, public transit agencies where you disclose problems with their, you know, their swipe cards and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And they're like not happy about it. <laughs> so it was like, a good thing I, you didn't get sued. <laughs> this led into another side investigation, which was power meters. Ooh. So the, like on the side of your house. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the digital power meters they had, they were just in the process of swapping everyone's out for remote monitoring ones. Yeah. And I didn't like that idea either. So I, I went to try to buy one to reverse engineer it. And it turns out that they don't want to sell it to the public. Um, <laughs> you know, the power meter companies are like, we need to know you're one of our approved vendors before we'll send it to you. So I was like, okay. Was there an eBay at the time? It, not on eBay. Yeah. <laughs> but good, good guess though, because it turns out that like, I was like, wait a second. There's lots of remote power meter type monitoring things. There's water meters. Yeah. So sure enough, on eBay, the control board for the mo- monitoring for pe- water meters is there. No yep. one was be really sensitive about water meters. So I was like, great, I'll get that board instead. <laughs> so I ordered it off of eBay for, I think, $30 and took it apart with a Dremel to get the case off and and because uh, they had it all waterproof and things. And, uh, you know, sure enough, MSV 430 again. So I was like, oh, I know these. <laughs> 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 so sure enough, it's unlocked again. So dump the flash and start reverse engineering again. I didn't have a vacation, so I actually had to sit at home and reverse engineer this one. But <laughs> yeah, I found that it used um, a different protocol, but it was also similar in terms of the, the, the basic construction of it to the uh, transponders. And there wasn't a remote update process, fortunately, but yeah. there were some other things about the handshake required for remote turnoffs. That was not really well implemented cryptographically. <laughs> um, they had made some attempts at crypto, whereas the transponder just broadcast out yeah. its serial number to anyone who queries it. So it was really, there was no crypto there. But they had not really done much work. I, I don't remember exactly what the flaw was, but it was something really elementary. Maybe it was like same key and everything or, or something oh, very, very rudimentary like that. Yeah. So I was like, this is terrible because it's one thing to design something that you can do remote monitoring of power. Right. It's another thing to have remote shutoff. Yeah. And they wanted the remote shutoff because they wanted to be able to prevent rolling blackouts or give people sort of voluntary ways to opt into. You, we'll pay you a lower rate if you let us shut down your refrigerator yeah. or your, your house, you know, mm-hmm. to save money. But still. But they hadn't had it all figured out. And it's like, I understand they only get to roll the trucks once to swap out the hardware. But at the same time, if you're going to design a system with that kind of power you re- or abilities, you know, you really need to think carefully about your, your crypto and, and your, your capabilities there. For example, having really strong secondary authentication for any actions you need to do, like yeah. two-factor, things like that, to, to, to launch an action. If you want to shut off the mayor's power, probably <laughs> there's some kind of log that goes through that you probably, you know, shouldn't just be any random city worker that can do that mm-hmm. or, you know, the hospital or something. Oh, God. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. It's just, it's just terrible. So like, I was like, again, I was like, okay, remote monitoring. Yes. There's privacy implications though. They're going to find out about my giant grow farm in the garage, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> or maybe I can spoof a grow farm at my neighbor's house, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh my God. This makes me think about <laughs> swatting people. And like, if you swat yeah. people, they, they come with guns, but you could go right. like one level below and just be like, oops, I turned your electricity off. Her, 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 like an asshole. Right. Exactly. It's a very elaborate way to swat somebody. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. it is. Instead of a phone call and, a, and, a, and a, a good little skit that you do to the to the cops, you you do a remote attack. I don't know. It's a lot easier to get away with. <laughs> there was like a run of time, like right after Obama got elected in 08. He had a bunch of high profile cabinet appoint, appointees. And one of his big ones was, I think, the Department of Energy. I can't remember the, the, the name of the guy, but like, it, it was a whole big thing. Oh, I think it was the physicist guy from MIT. That guy. Yeah. (laughs) So, like, there was a big push towards, like, smart grid stuff. There had Mm -hmm. been, like, a huge power outage, like, a nation, like, from, like, you know, most of the eastern seaboard power uh, power outage a couple years before. So, like, getting the grid more resilient was a big thing, Mm -hmm. and, like, conservation was a big thing. So, this is, like, this huge push towards smart grid stuff. 
And long story short, like pretty much every AppSec firm in the world now has a story about how they could turn people's power off because there's like, I think there was like six or seven different vendors um, that were doing different systems there. This is by the way, the, the reason why every time any kind of discussion about crypto protocols comes up, I ask people whether the counters and their counter mode encryption can wrap. <laughs> I told that to Trevor Perrin once. He's like, is that a realistic concern? Like, are you really going to wrap like a, a GCM counter or whatever? Cause it's, it's, a, it's a huge, like, really Realistically, it's a, it's a huge counter, right? It's because I worked on some smart meter thing, which was all embedded crypto, where they were doing like a full on bidirectional RF protocol. And the, the message headroom they had was very, very small. So they were doing counter mode, but with a very short truncated counter, which you could easily wrap. And that's like, that's actually not really a super realistic problem, but it's a thing I keep bringing up. Just like, you know, logging into a web app the first time with quote unquote yeah. equals quote yeah. and thinking that's going to keep popping up. It's like someday I will find another system where you can actually exploit it by wrapping its counter or whatever. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's, all, all those systems were super fun to work with. But like, did you ever on any of these projects get to the point where you were directly transmitting back? Like, did you have a transmitter for the either the toll stuff or for the smart meter stuff? <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, there's a specific reason why the answer is no on that. So there's a fine line between disclosing something and making yourself a target for various kinds of retaliatory action. And that's, uh, that was definitely, which seems totally, it seems totally fair. Right. But like if you're on like an actual contracted test with a vendor, right? Like it seems like that's, that's well within bounds, but I've been talking to people every time I hear somebody that's done an RF project. It's like one of the first questions I asked is like, do you actually have the whole RF stack implemented or are you just using, you know, a device that you, you know, reversed as a modem for it, right? I haven't really talked to anyone yet that's done it, but I'm, I'm curious to see if anyone was actually built the whole, you know, kind of communication stack for any of these systems or if they've just injected code into, you know, a meter or whatever. Yeah, for these cases, I mean, the um, fast track transponder was actually very easy to tap into. And so I built my own connector and I could drive around using my laptop and my PC oscilloscope and record all the IDs of the light poles as we drove past them. Because what they do is they have two different protocols. One was like, what's your serial number? The other one's, what's your serial number and beep. And that one's for you go through the toll plaza. And the what's your serial number was for monitoring the speed of highway traffic on various segments of the freeway. And so one of the things that the thought experiments I did and, and talked about in my blog a bit was how could you actually design this in a mm. privacy preserving way with the same basic hardware restrictions? So you're, you're driving around on a highway. You don't want to broadcast a persistent ID everywhere you go and create a log on their systems of everywhere you've been. So is there a way to calculate the average speed of traffic on various segments of the highway without doing that? And there's lots of different protocols you could do if you thought of privacy actually <laughs> mattering when you designed it. Which the uh, the government probably didn't think is a concern when they deployed these things. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you're if I was in charge of, of designing like this smart grid stuff back in the day, I might do something like add a control port, like a physical control port for a peripheral bus onto the, the meter or something like that. Be like, okay, once we decide how we're going to do control stuff, maybe people who opt into it will mail them something, you know, a little package that they can just go plug onto the side of their meter with a consumer accessible kind of thing. It's like, you want to opt into this program of saving money, then uh -huh. plug this into the side of your house kind uh -huh. of thing. You know, it's very easy to do user friendly. And once you plug it in, you're now part of this thing. If you don't plug into it, then you're not opted in. And someone can easily tell if a given house is participating in this yeah. remote shut off kind of situation. Yeah. You can only opt so. into this remote shut off thing. You, it, you will not be deployed to you by default uh, by the right. government. <laughs> right. And, and yeah, and, and turned on already before they figured everything out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure some of the motivation for remote shut off is just minimizing truck rolls for mm -hmm. actually shutting Absolutely. people off. So like, yeah, the opt in thing, it, it addresses one of their stories, but probably not the real story they mm -hmm. have. Right. Which is yeah. just it costs us money to shut people off. Wouldn't it be nice if we could like have a cron job that shuts people off? Absolutely. Yeah. No, cost savings was, I think, the bigger reason for that, not not for load shifting. This is Root Labs in the 2000s, late 2000s? 2008, 2009. Okay. Um, there was something you were working on about 2011 about some sort of mobile payment system. Can you tell us about that? Some sort sure. of mobile payment system. Yeah. I don't know what <laughs> sort. There was some sort of mobile payment system. <laughs> Well, it doesn't really matter to specifics. It's what matters is how, how it works. Ah. So I was um, 
yeah, another vacation. I, it sounds like I took lots of vacations, but I really didn't. Uh, I was like, you know, driving down the freeway and I got a call on my phone and someone was like, I, who I knew casually was like, Hey, we're designing this new device. It's going to be, you know, it's mobile payment system. It needs security. And, uh, we need it yesterday. Okay. And I was like, okay, yeah, <laughs> um, sure. I'd be happy to help with that. And that ended up being the same weekend that the tsunami hit, oh, uh, God. hit Japan. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so it was like very memorable to me. It was, it was like uh, being on vacation and hearing the uh, tsunami warnings going off in California because of the, uh, the sirens from that. Jeez. Yeah. So that was a propitious start. Uh, but <laughs> when I got back, I, was, I talked to the company more. And what they were doing was they had a design firm who was helping them build this new device. And it's going to be a you know, payment terminal and accept credit cards and all this. So they wanted it to be secure. And it's kind of interesting some of the requirements for it because you know they wanted it to use this little flash as possible, little, little storage as possible to make it cheap. You want a long battery life as well. Uh, so you don't have to keep re- replacing the battery on it. And also security wise, you know, you think, oh yeah, just encrypt everything. But um, actually with um, payment systems, sometimes you don't want to encrypt everything. Like uh, for example, you want to leave like the last four digits of the credit card number in right. the clear so yeah. that an intermediate device can present a dialogue to the user yeah. and, you know, help them understand what's going on things like that. So they said, we're going to do this and it's got to fit in, I think the original requirement was 4K. And okay. I was like, okay, 4K for what? And they're like, well, we're going to do like 1K for the card swipe handling, like the, the logic for that. 1K for AES. <laughs> 1K, I can't remember what the, the third 1K was for. And then 1K for like everything else. And I was like, <laughs> so the, the encryption protocol, yeah, yes. The uh, message swizzling, yes. And so the asymmetric crypto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there, uh, asymmetric crypto didn't really fit in this. It was a, a really, again, a really small device, microcontroller basically, and uh, it didn't have any acceleration for, for public key crypto. So what we did was we were going to build something off of symmetric crypto. And uh, we, there was some negotiation over which 1K bucket was going to be holding which functionality. <laughs> and so the design firm, I don't know if you've worked with design firms before, but they're very good on like kind of industrial design. They're mm-hmm. pretty good at rapid prototyping, but <laughs> in terms of making something production ready, they mm-hmm. tend to not be so focused on cost reduction and design for manufacturing, testability, things like that. And long-term maintenance of the code. <laughs> it, absolutely. Yeah. So <laughs> there was a bit of tug of war between us where I was like, you know, well, you should really own this part of it. And they're like, well, this is, no, this is, we don't have room for this because we got all this other stuff. So basically everything kept getting shoved into my 1K bucket until I was left with, once the card had been swiped, all the protocol handling for it, all the crypt, uh, cipher mode stuff, and uh, a lot of the message swizzling and the error handling and things like that. So all that was in this 1K bucket. Hmm. And I, I was like, well, I think I can make it fit. But, you know, <laughs> and AES itself was it was one of the 1K of it as well. So we got down to designing it and working on it. And I really wanted to get this right once because it was going to be, you know, millions of device recall if something was really bad about this. A big reputation hit and and a lot of potential damage, even even if the actual risk to individual users of the device was low if, if there was a, a bug in the software. Mm-hmm. So at the time, it was very difficult to do um, AEA D modes. There okay. was OCB, there was like XEX, there was a few different modes and mm-hmm. sort of the big giant AES modes, the two pass modes. And there was also a one pass modes, which is OCB. But mm-hmm. that was patented, and so nobody. Yeah, really I was gonna to say, like, that. I don't, I don't think you had OCB had quote unquote air quotes OCB at the time, 2011, because of patents. You only we've right. only quote got it in the past few years because it came out of patent. Right. Yeah. So the company didn't want OCB, and actually, the first thing I offered to them was like a tweaked XTEA mode, uh-huh. and the reason for that was to buy back some of that 1K from AES implementation itself. But they're like, no, no, for standards reasons, it's got to be AES. And I was like, okay, fine. So And no GCM. No GCM, no. Too heavy weight for a microcontroller. Too heavy. All right, okay, okay. Yeah, all the polynomial multiplies would, would be too heavy for it. So Wild, okay. For the uh, authenticator. So I scoured the literature for what other modes could be <laughs> turned into a one-pass mode that's also tiny to implement. And I came across this thing I think it's probably the only time or the the biggest market use of this particular mode. I've never seen it used anywhere else, but it's called CCFB. So everyone knows CFB. 
And CFB itself is not really often used, or hmm. in the, even in the past it wasn't. CBC was much more common. But cipher feedback mode, this one had a counter cipher feedback <laughs> mode. So it was a combination of counter mode for encryption and cipher feedback mode for creating authenticator tag mm -hmm. for that. And um, it was a kind of a clever mode, I thought. And I needed to tweak it to be really tiny to fit the authenticated data portion, because like I said, like the last four digits of the credit card number, you need to authenticate that, but not encrypt it. Yep. And so CCFB was pitched as a two pass mode, but with like a wink and a smile because it could be <laughs> actually implemented as a one pass mode, but they didn't want to look like they were infringing on patents. So, right. Okay. So they specified it as a two pass, but if you just implemented the two passes as in a, in a single pass, you could you could do that. There weren't dependencies between the two passes. So like <laughs> a, a one pass mode here, and maybe I'm just wrong about it, or maybe I'm demystifying it. You never know with me. But like one pass mode in an authenticated cipher, we're talking about the two operations of first encrypting it, you know, transforming plain text to cipher text, and then also creating some kind of you know tag or MAC or hash that goes to the end of that verifies that the, you know, that the whatever you've decrypted matches what was encrypted in the first place, right? And then a one pass and two pass refers to how many times like the cipher core or whatever cipher core, you know, there might be different ones for authentication or encryption, but like however many times it has to go span the input, right? Like a one pass thing is simultaneously encrypting and authenticating in the same one cryptographic sweep across the plain text. And a two pass mode is potentially you know, going twice over wants to encrypt and then wants to create the authentication tag. That's right, right? I, I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. Yes, that's correct. At the time, there weren't, uh, other than OCB, which is patented, there weren't very many one pass modes. In fact, I think this was the only other one I knew of. So this one was explicitly in the public domain, which was cool. So I modified it rather than doing that. It did have a separate authenticated data pass. But again, due to memory constraints, I only had less than a kilobyte of RAM to work with as well. So what I ended up doing was I actually ended up reusing the card swipe buffer as I went along for <laughs> variable storage. So parts oh, of the card no. data that were no longer used became counters and stuff, which is not a good programming practice, but was necessary in this particular environment. Did you ever run in, into any issues with that or did you check everything? Yeah, I would just be so scared to do that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was too. <laughs> I very carefully uh, spec'd it out. I designed the code to be really, really, really small, like I, not just small comp compilation, but small source code as well. And the messages were all fixed size. Everything was fixed size. Even yeah. if there's a few bytes wasted here and there, by keeping everything fixed size, it avoided having length fields that could yeah. then Got lead it. to buffer yep. overflows, integer overflows, whatever. And yeah, so it'd be like, you know, what's the maximum you, uh, name that can appear on a credit card? Okay, this number of characters. <laughs> so we're not going to try to compress it or throw away spaces or anything like that. We'll just like, this field is always this size. So in order to convert this one pass mode into to do authenticated data without this extra step it had for the authenticator, because we didn't have time or space for that, what it did was it just encrypted the authenticated portion of the data, the clear text data, but threw away the, the, the key stream for those, that part of the message. Right. And uh, it was a very small hack, but you know, you could prove that it degenerates back to the original case of encrypting it, um, nice. but you're basically exposing some plain text and throwing away key stream. Mm -hmm. So I did that in order to avoid temporary variables, did things like moving things around in the buffer by swapping repeatedly. So it's like <laughs> reverse this string, reverse this string, and then swap them by reversing okay. the whole thing. So they did <laughs> stuff like that, like repeated reversals. And that's kind of an interesting way to swap multi-byte fields without actually explicitly swapping them. Did some some little hacks like that, and then that's basically horrible. built this. That's horrible. I just, I, I just <laughs> the, the picture just crystallized in my head of what you're doing there. That's horrible. <laughs> yeah, so that was to get the last four digits into the clear text authenticated data field. Uh, oh. So I knew a fixed offset, like encrypt all these bytes up to here, and then beyond that, don't encrypt these bytes, and then pass off the end authenticator tag at the end. And so all the plain text stuff had to be gathered together at the end of the message, so that we could just have a single switch instead of switching on and off between ciphertext or not. Uh, mm -hmm. which would have made the code more complicated. So yeah, so you hmm. do like reverse a part of it, reverse the other part of it, and then reverse the whole thing. What like you swap. What horrible 1980s <laughs> Dr. Dobbs nonsense is this? Where did you get that? <laughs> <laughs> I just came up with it, honestly. Like, I mean, there's a lot of stuff of swapping via repeated XORs, for example, that's used in, in some kinds of things. And that, hmm. that kind of stuff comes also when you're doing hardware design. Like if you're designing, designing FPGAs or ASICs, there's a lot of tricks you do like that because wires are free in ASICs, you're just <laughs> connecting one spot on the chip to another spot. So you can swap wires all you want to, and it costs zero resources when you're moving data from one part of the chip to the other. 
Mm-hmm. So this was that kind of uh, thing. <laughs> but anyways, it succeeded. I was able to get everything into one kilobyte, all the message wow. handling, the checksum, the, the, the uh, authenticator, the encryption mode, all this into there. Is, I was really proud of that code. I built a fuzzer for it and shipped wow. like my delivered, <laughs> my delivered to the customer. I'm like, here's the code that implements it. It compiles down into less than a kilobyte for the microcontroller. You can also compile it in, uh, it's in st- st- C code, but you can compile it on the host side. And here's a plugin API for using it to to decrypt on the host side once you receive these encrypted credit card numbers. Yeah. And I fuzzed the heck out of this thing. Like I fuzzed every bit of the message, you know, and all, all these different things. So, you know, I'm really reasonably confident with fixed size messages and even, even this kind of funky handling and stuff like that. This actually is correct in terms of the implementation. Nice. But it took a lot of time. I mean, at CRI, we would often say, if you want to have high assurance in a system, you have to spend 10 times the resources on verification yeah. as mm-hmm. you do on designing a system. And so I really did put a lot of time into that as far as the verification stage. It wasn't just like hack out some code and there you go, yep. ship it and I'm done with the project. Yep. Yep. So yeah, that actually, it worked. It shipped. And I got the wonderful news at the end of the project that, well, actually the design firm couldn't fit their stuff into their, their one kilobyte. So we're going with the 8K part to the 4K part. And it's like, <laughs> I just tore my hair out over this 1K. <laughs> it's also a problem that no one is ever going to have again. Everything now is just ARM. Right? It's, it's very disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question, like why the obsession with doing a single pass mode in the first place, right? You're just burning compute there, not actually code space, right? Well, there's a very limited amount of RAM that was part of it. Uh, okay. And also there was a latency issue. So oh, when you swipe okay. a credit card through a terminal, you want to be able to show the user immediately that you have a valid swipe, that, you know, their four digits of their number is correct, things like that. Like you want to be able to present to them that it succeeded. Otherwise, they're going to try to swipe again. And so mm-hmm. it would have taken a few seconds to do like a two pass mode. Whereas with the one pass mode, I mean, already AES on an 8-bit microcontroller is pretty slow, just AES itself. Huh. I, I don't know what implementation we ended up using, but it was not optimized for 8-bit microcontrollers. So it was just one of those things where it's like, okay, we're running, I think it's maybe 16 megahertz. I don't remember exactly, 12 or 16. So everything was just like, fit it fit in as little time as possible latency-wise and as, as few re- resources as possible to make the chip cheap. And this was for swipes, not for chips at the time, Correct. I assume, right? Because yeah. even for chips, apparently it's okay to make people wait like eight minutes for a chip to go through <laughs> based on my experience uh, uh, with point of sale systems. I mean, sometimes people care more about the quality of things when you when it's the first version of it. You know, it's the reputation yeah. thing. And it's like then you get focus on cost and things kind of have a race to the bottom in terms of quality after that. Well, mm-hmm. like the chip reader also takes custody of your of your card while it's doing the thing and then tells you when you can have it back. So you have like a yeah, you have a, you have a lot of leeway there. Right. But right. when people are swiping, they, they can autonomously swipe over and over again until it never works. Yep. Huh. I'm developing opinions about latency in uh, payment card systems now. I didn't I didn't, I didn't have them before, but now I do. And my opinions are that David is wrong. um i think you said that they needed to use aes for reasons for standards reasons but i think i was just double checking that cha-cha poly which was supposed to be much nicer for software only implementations of an aead was available at this time but they just didn't want to use it but not on an 8-bit micro right like you'd still be because cha-cha wants a multiplier doesn't it am i wrong about that uh i forget i don't know (laughs) i don't remember either but there are some much better choices nowadays. So by describing it this way, I'm not saying this is the recommended way to do it now, but. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But yeah, I was just sort of like, oh, if you're doing like a, a lower capability device, like the thing I would reach for first would be Cha-Cha Poly just because like that's, it's explicitly supposed to be for uh, lower power, lower capability devices as opposed to to AES GCM, which is sort of like the gob standard for a device if you just need an AED. Now, although we will have other people be like, that is a fragile mode, then you should use OCB or, you know, whatever the less difficult to implement, uh, less likely to break on you uh, AED mode now- those, nowadays. Those but. people are right too, right? But like the big the big distinction between Poly 1305 and, uh, and GCM is that you don't need a careless, like to, to get like a constant time implementation, you don't need a careless multiplication instruction for for Poly 1305 and you would for GCM. Yeah, I think that's right. That sounds correct. <laughs> I mean, because of PCI, people wanted to use AES so that they would uh, not yeah, get okay. flagged for a non-standard crypto and uh, all yes. these other things. Okay. Even the mode I was using was something that caused some pause of like, why isn't it GCM or why isn't it, you know, AES or whatever it was, you know. 
It's like, because and, you only gave me 1K. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus. Exactly. <laughs> if, if you want the boring crypto, quote unquote, boring crypto, according to the PCI standard, I need more room. Right. This chip. Exactly. <laughs> so if you were going to add some, if you were going to, for some reason, add symmetric cryptography to Apple II Karatika, what would you have used instead of AES? Would it have been a TEA derivative? Yeah. I mean, that was my first inclination was XX TEA or whatever at, at the time. And possibly making it a little more robust by doing like a, a multi-key combination of it. But now you'd use NSA spec. I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly. I mean, my bet, if I had unlimited resources at the time, uh, public key crypto obviously would have been the choice, not the symmetric key system. Because when you have symmetric crypto only on a consumer device that's in the millions, you end up with a key management problem. And so mm. that was a whole separate part of the design, which was like, how do you do key trees for both in the factory, being able to easily create the right key for the right device? Uh, so they each had a unique key and then do the production step of, of personalizing each one with this key. And then also revocation, if you need to be able to say, you know, this terminal has been compromised. We've caught it sending spoofed credit card numbers or whatever out of it. Don't accept messages from this thing ever again. And so that, that kind of stuff happens on the, the production side and the server side. And it's definitely important to think about that. Was there anything on these small devices that had to remember deny listed connections or keys or anything like that? Okay, good. No, not not necessarily. But it, it's kind of funny when you think about what are the attacks. If you've got these you know cheap payment terminals all over the place and people can can swipe a card through it, like what is actually going to be happening when it's in the, the real world? Right. So people could take them apart, extract <laughs> the AES key from their device and create a full clone of it and lie about it, inject all kinds of credit card numbers off of dumps they found on the internet into this thing and try to get money out of it. Mm -hmm. But that's not, uh, not likely to happen because it's very easy to revoke that number. And also you see like 10,000 credit cards come through one terminal in a day or something like that. You know, probably something weird's going on. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff you can do on the physical side as well, because when people swipe things, it's human driven. Mm -hmm. And so there are natural variations in the timing, for example, of like yeah. nobody swipes like a robot. Yeah. <laughs> and if you do it right, you get a one kilohertz tone through it uh, as far as the rate. You want, you want to have a solid one kilohertz uh, swipe rate, uh, which is an audio band. But but most people don't do that. So you'll you'll get like wow and flutter from old tape systems when people slow down and speed up as they swipe or whatever. And so from that kind of thing, you can actually know a bit more about whether something's legit or not. But yeah, it's the, the kinds of attacks that were kind of interesting to think about were, are people going to use this to launder credit cards that they've compromised through other systems through this to try to extract money from it? Are they going to try to like use it to like double spend stuff like uh, benefit cards or some kind of like uh, coupon codes or whatever, like other than things like that? Are people going to like try to use to repurpose this, buy a bunch of these like the QCAT scanner and then reuse it to launch their own business of some kind by right by cloning it and saying i got these things for cheap or free you know like so let's just pick up a thousand of them and then start our own competitor <laughs> <You know? laughs> nate and i have friends who've done things like that which is why nate's concerned about it so i see <laughs> uh, we, we have a friend that like with, with this first million dollars he made or something like that he's, he's amazing but his first million dollars i think he purchased 800 mirrors for his house just because he could <laughs> and uh so he just had mirrors everywhere <laughs> Just to look at himself. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I think he's just like, oh, I could buy like thousands of these. So I'm going to do it. <laughs> All right. Most of us uh, stop right before that. So I'm going to do it part. But this person like just goes and does it. That reminds me, I need to get a mirror for my wall. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the founder of Justin TV bought like three or four massive like sculptures of dragons or dinosaurs or something that they just that laughed I at his garage. That I understand. I was like, well... <laughs> I guess we could do this. <laughs> this is before there was Alibaba and like the joke got old because there's really nothing you can say if you can't just go type Aquarian and buy a million of right now, like yes. goats or. Yeah. <laughs> so you did the payment card thing. You're uh, you're doing consulting stuff. You didn't stay at uh, just consulting for that long, right? Like I remember talking to you during this time, right? Like you have a startup after this. Yeah, uh, it's something that CRI did really well, which I was impressed with, and I always wanted to do myself as also, uh, was to use consulting as a way to sort of pay the bills and do solve fun problems for people, but also like to get ideas about a startup or, or um, <laughs> things that they could design. This is the kiss of death here, by the way. <laughs> like, Tom and Nate, Tom and Nate startup advice. 
it, it's not good general advice for startups to just start with consulting, but it has worked for some people I know in my soul. And it's not that you're getting ideas from your customers and then you're building a competing product or something like that. It's, it's not like that. Instead, it's you're, you look for unmet needs. It's like, right. I would sell this to all of my customers if I had a product that could do X and mm -hmm. nobody creates this yet. And it's really fun because, it, you know, YC uh, went through Y Combinator later on and they tell you to like, you know, talk to customers, talk to customers like repeatedly. And talking to customers is great if you have a reason to talk to customers or mm -hmm. are good at it or have an in or whatever. But consulting is a great way that you're forced to talk to customers and forced to pay attention to their needs and problems because they're asking you to solve some problem that they think they have. Mm -hmm. And it may not be the actual problem that they really do have, but that's sort of where the insight comes from is being able to be exposed to it. Whereas if you just showed up off the street and said, I'm a startup yeah. person, I've got an idea how to solve your problem. And it, they're not going to always tell you, oh, no, our problem is actually this other thing. Yeah. So, yeah, in 2011, I had been doing a lot of reverse engineering. So the work on embedded systems had kind of led into more reverse engineering on the software side. And I was doing actually kind of bulk reverse engineering, I call it. Like I'd scripted a bunch of stuff and I was helping a company with, that was looking for like say GPL license infringement and other kinds oh, of, okay. of license infringement where it's like, we've got this thing and it's GPL, but people are putting it in their devices and then selling it and they're not paying us royalties. And we have a dual license, you know, for it. So we want to go after them for GPL for taking the open source version of it and just not paying us. And so I did it by hand a bit, you know, Ida Pro and, and scripts and things like that, but got really boring really quickly. So I was like, okay, if I could dump the firmware from any device and then dump them into some kind of system that could tell me all the code that was inside this thing. You know, we're talking relatively large stuff, libraries, not like single functions. Right. If I could tell me all the libraries that are that were used to build this thing with some confidence level, then I could make this self-service. And then the customer is then just like uploading a bunch of software into this web service or whatever. And it's telling them, you know, hey, I found these four libraries in it with 90 percent confidence or whatever. Then you could tie this into their royalty system of like mailing letters <laughs> to the company. It's like type in the address of the company where you got this thing and then we'll send them a letter that says, you know, hey, you GPL infringed our thing. You know, here's the code. <laughs> Maybe you send them a nice little comparison of the, the flow graphs of the two programs or whatever to say, hey, here's how the evidence or whatever, mm. you know, pay up or whatever. So I thought that was kind of cool. I've always been a fan of, of Halvar, a really smart person. And, and um, you know, the Bindiff work was pretty amazing. So I was like, well, Bindiff is great at finding like patches that are missing in things. But most of the tools that you see for reverse engineering are human centric and they focus on finding a needle in a haystack. Yeah. It's like you want to find this one comparison instruction. Is it a signed or an unsigned comparison? Because otherwise there's a vulnerability here. And that's one important problem to solve. But there's also a different problem to solve, which is like, I've got a million pieces of software. A person can never look at them. Yep. Can you, with some threshold of confidence, tell me high level things about this software? Mm -hmm. Such as, does it contain this library or not to some level of competence, regardless of what obfuscation someone's applied to it, mm -hmm. um, like obfuscation tools, again, not individual recoding something by hand or something like yeah. that to say that does this basically look the same thing. So I started trying to build that system. And uh, originally it was focused on this problem of like, go after customers that are licensors, technology firms that are licensing stuff. And help them make more money, basically, off of their portfolios <laughs> from companies that aren't paying them. So I got that going. And it turns out, though, that there aren't very many firms that actually want to pay for that kind of service. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of companies that do like open source license management stuff, like Black Duck software and things like that. But it's all source code based, not binaries. This is all based uh -huh. on binaries. And there was some, some money to be made there, but although it was a relatively small market, but there was not really a huge market of people that were like, yeah, just we're just want to feed binaries into this thing and tell me. <laughs> Who, who to send lenders to. Mm -hmm. So there was a while there where things were not going well revenue wise and it was trying to pivot. And I was like, okay, what do we do next? We've got this capability. Actually even had come up with some cool ways to do like at scale binary analysis mm -hmm. and uh, similarity analysis as well. And it's like, okay, what other problems can we solve that might, might actually be successful? And um, at the time, the app stores were kind of taking off. Mm -hmm. This is like huh. early 2010s. So uh -huh. it's like by 2012, 2013 timeframe, I was pivoting and it was like, okay, app stores are taking off. There's millions of apps now. Yep. And if there's millions of apps, what things can we tell people about 
all these apps because it's a black box, yep. especially on, on, on iOS where you don't yep. get to inspect the binaries in most cases. And so we built a system that would crawl app stores. We were crawling the iTunes app store, Google Play, a bunch of Chinese Android stores. Mm-hmm. And just um, by this time, we, we what we had was we had intermediate language. We um, air quotes decompile. Uh, it wasn't full decompilation. It was more of a, a rough translation into this higher level IR. What the cool yep. kids would call lifting, right? <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. And it didn't need to be precise again. It wasn't like it, the, the point of it was not to be precise and do lots of crunching on it with lots of CPU cycles to tell exactly what it's doing. It was just like, do you roughly have these kinds of data flows or these yep. control flow com- combinations yep. of things Yep. at a high level? And then identifying libraries and things. So it's like, okay, we'll, we'll just tell like every SDK or, or library that's compiled into these apps because in iOS, it was static linking. For Android, a lot of times it's dynamic linking, which was like trivial. But then it was kind of like, okay, how do apps compare across platforms? Like how do Android apps by the same vendor compare to the iOS apps? And what insights can we gain? And it started taking off, actually. We started getting big name customers like Google and Facebook. And they were really interested in our data because we would have like high numbers of apps going through these things, you know, thousands and thousands of apps we were analyzing. And we were pulling down updates as soon as they were published and uh, updating sending people differential stuff like, hey, this library just got added to this app. Someone added yeah. a new analytics library to it. We were telling people trends and we could say like, here are the top libraries for games. You know, people are using this uh, Unity 3D libraries versus, yep. you know, Unreal Engine or whatever. And uh, that started really taking off. It was fun. And um, we joined Y Combinator kind of to see like, can we get some actual funding? Because it's all bootstrapped off the consulting revenue originally. Yeah. And we were profitable, but not hugely so. And so we went to Y Combinator and worked on turning this into a bigger business. And at the same time, I, I came up with an idea that was, was I'm really proud of as like a, like a business model, even if it's not technically that, that interesting. But it was like, we're crawling all these apps. We got all this data on them. What things can we also reuse as a, in a different market? And so at the time, again, like developers didn't really have good views into what libraries they were even including in their apps. Like sometimes a developer huh. would be surprised when you tell them, oh, you've linked this. And it's like, Oh, really? You know, it's like, oh, yeah, because we linked this in and it pulled in this other library as a dependency. And so they'd have uh, there's a crash reporting library in iOS that you'll have like three or four copies of the same crash reporting library because every analytics library also links against it and it's statically linked. And so you pulled in multiple versions of the same library and it's terrible code bloat. But for for Rust users right now, if you want to avoid this, there's a tool called Cargo Deny that lets you (laughs) eliminate conflicting different versions of a deep, deep dependency. So <laughs> it's an amazing future. I like it. But yeah, th- this is like terrible. Like it was like you're getting static blobs dumped on top of static blobs, all with, depending on the same underlying things, but different versions. Yeah. And so this is obviously a security problem and there's a su- security supply chain problem there as well. So it was like, well, we can resell this data to developers if we just go after like the most recent CVEs or whatever in mobile apps. <sighs> We know what the most popular libraries are. So we oh can say, we've God. got this CVE. You've got this library that's in 20,000 apps. Notify 20,000 developers. You all have the security problem to update your dependency of whatever it is. Yeah. So it's like, oh, yeah, someone would probably pay five bucks a month for this or 10 bucks a month for this notification service. So what we did was we just, again, we ranked CVEs <laughs> by number of apps that have that library to find the ones to actually build signatures for. Right. And then we took those top CVEs and or, you know, patches, even if some of them didn't even have CVEs, they'd just be yeah. like a, a branch on GitHub or whatever, because, again, <laughs> security handling across open source libraries isn't always the greatest. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and no, so we're not. just like, OK, <laughs> let's create a signature for this, dump it into our latest scans of the app stores and then be like, OK, there's 20,000 apps of the thing. And we've created a, a UI for people to just like a, this is like a weekend project of like <laughs> you can go in and, and enter the apps that you use and it would tell you which things were vulnerable to which problems. And we dumped a couple different binary bugs into that. And then we said, you know, hey, if you, if you sign up with us, we'll give you advance notice of these kinds of problems as we find them in the future. <laughs> and so we got, I think in a week or two, we had 3000 developers actually sign up. Yeah. Um, for, yeah. For not monitoring their apps. Good for uh, that. Which to me was, <laughs> yeah. I mean, going from like, you know, tens of customers to 3000 instantly was kind of cool, even if they weren't paying for anything yet. And that was kind of how we got to the scale and got our initial seed round. And uh, I think I still think there's a, a really big market there for helping developers with insights to their code. I mean, they're just like GitHub Copilot, for example, and other things like that that are there helping people build stuff, but also just giving people insights into the things you've already done. Yeah. It's like, hey, you built this app this way. 
you might have these problems or someone's watching over your shoulder to make sure if there's security problems in the future, we'll let you know. That's wild because you built you built something that's not, you know, 100 percent every time. It's not supposed to be foolproof, but you're literally looking at the binary and, you know, creating this. You're lifting it to send up some other imp- representation, which is theoretically even better in a certain way than like I have a package.json or I have a cargo.toml. I have all my dependencies listed, but like at the end of the day, you are the, the blob that you're trying to execute is the source of truth. And like nowadays you've got Dependabot, which is now owned by GitHub. And so like it'll do a lot of those things that you had to build from scratch. But it is depending on an encoding of all of your dependencies all the way down. Um, if you don't have that, you're out of luck. Like if you're just writing C and you just stick it on GitHub, it's just sort of like you, you don't get no dependable help. Like we yeah. would need a source CNA because like there's no way to just like go look up those dependency versions and associate them with the CBE. And I don't think they do any, they rely on like the Rust security advisory project or whatever, which like humans filing like security alerts against versions of crates and things like that. Um, whereas you were doing it all by hand. You weren't even doing CVEs. You were just like, this is a bad branch of this library that someone has compiled into their project. You might want to fix that. That's a lot of work. <laughs> it was. There's also like the like the advantage of looking at the binaries. You can also tell if code's actually being used. Um, yeah. Like 99% of depend about alerts are useless, right? They're like, you know, JavaScript prototype injection problems in JavaScript that you don't even use, right? But yeah, if you're looking at the binary, yeah, you can see if it's dead code or not. Yeah, yeah. That's that way was one of our useful. competitive advantages, actually, when we were doing the analytics data was this is a lot of this is by hand. There's a lot of grunt work that you do by hand to yeah. get things off the ground. But by hand, we identified what were the important public APIs of all these libraries, because the library isn't just like one function that does one yep. thing. It's usually like a collection of things. And yep. from larger companies like Google and Amazon, they offer entire SDKs with like maps and game analytics and mm. whatever, all the stuff thrown in there. And it's like, OK. Which parts of the maps SDK is this app using? Is it using the fine grain location tracking or is it using like geofencing? And so we would categorize and hand label some of these different APIs. And we knew which APIs were important because, again, we could sum them up across all the apps in our collection and say, OK, what are the top five functions that are called from outside of the library, yeah. but from the apps itself? Uh, across a huge collection of apps. And we say, okay, let's hand label those top five functions as, you know, geofencing or whatever the functionality yeah. was of that one by looking in the docs. And then we could tell the marketers or people that were subscribing to this data feed, like which parts of Google APIs are taking off this month and which parts are being le- le- used less and being mm-hmm. replaced with competitors information mm-hmm. or competitors APIs. I mean, so that that was really interesting. And actually that's something that I, I've always loved as a business model, which is take a whiz bang technology and give it to the least technical people in a way that they can use it. So in this case, it's like give marketers Ida Pro <laughs> at scale. <laughs> and it's like marketers are people that buy marketing data. Like, like they're, they're never going to be able to learn Ida Pro and be able to right. decompile an app and figure out what it's doing. Um, and certainly not at scale. And so, but if they had that data, they can make really interesting decisions about how they, they change their competitive strategies or their marketing strategies. Yeah. Yeah. So around <laughs> the time, I think that, that you had, had exited, um, was when we were starting to try and figure out how to spin census out into a startup. Mm-hmm. And I remember I passed through Illinois. Um, and so I, I talked to Thomas and I was like, well, we got like these network insights, but they're like good at some stuff and not other stuff. And no one really wants to pay for like TLS vulnerabilities. But it seems like knowing like what's on your network and like what server software would be good. And oh, by the way, has anyone ever thought of like bulk reversing a bunch of things in the app store and saying what <laughs> libraries they use? And Thomas is like, well, the good news is you hit the nail on the head on that one. The bad news is you should have met Nate a few years earlier. <laughs> Um, and I am kicking myself for not joining his company. <laughs> <laughs> was that you, David, or was that Thomas? That was, that was Thomas who was, <laughs> said he was kicking himself for, for not joining Source DNA. Um, and my claim to fame is I came up with the idea for Source DNA independently five years late. There you nice. go. Nice. No, that's great. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's, all, it's all different iterations of the same thing. And I mean, we had some defic- deficiencies in terms of there was one app where they had backported a fix, like just a point fix for a specific problem without backporting the entire point version of the library. 
Uh-huh. And so we identified it, misidentified it as, or correctly identified, I guess, as the old library because we didn't look for this one branch that had changed. And so it's like, uh-huh. yes, if you're trying to prove that this one app is vulnerable or not, we're not the tool for that. Like we don't solve that very well. Hmm. But yeah, there's, there's, there's ups and, and downs to each of these approaches. But, you know, when people go and try to attack this same problem different ways, you, you, you could take different angles at it. And the one, the one I thought was kind of the unique insight for us was that if you're doing things at scale with lots of different data, your approach to it is very different from the traditional reverse engineering route, where okay. you're with like you with microscope and tweezers with a single <laughs> binary is like the traditional reverse engineering. But like counting the number of function calls from a labeled API, because it's, mm-hmm. you know, you got a symbol for it or whatever like that, mm-hmm. from every bit of code, which is most unique possible in, in, in that app, you can kind of found, find the boundaries between APIs and libraries because in the library, things will have kind of the same type signatures, the same, same set of code. You identify that and it's like, okay, if I've got a caller who only appears in 10 apps, that could be a wrapper library that yeah. this developer uses around this thing. If it's from a million apps, it's a public API because nobody owns an, an all million apps on the app store. And so you can kind of do these things in aggregate or statistically that otherwise would require really sophisticated analysis. First of all, I like how when Dave retells anything I've done, I'm a 1950s movie producer. Hey, kid. <laughs> the good news is, <laughs> chomping out my cigar. This is like a thing with me, though. Like the reversing thing here is, um, I don't know, I spend too much time on message boards, right? But there's like a there's a common perception among technical people of what serious, serious reverse engineering looks like. And that perception is, Nate pretending to take a vacation while reading assembly with a, you know, pen and paper. Right. But like in reality, like everyone's using tools, everyone's looking at higher level abstractions. Like you're not like, you don't start at the first line and then read in a straight line all the way through the code. Right. Like I I remember like, like finally getting this through my head, like in the mid aughts with, uh, I think it was Pedro Mamini with the Pyme or whatever, whoever did Pyme apologies to whoever did Pyme, but that was like, um, Mm -hmm. it, it was like setting debugger trace points on every, you know, at the beginning of every basic block in a program, which is trivial. It's just a loop around the program. It sounds complicated, but it's not complicated at all, right? Like, so you take the disassembly, you uh, you mark every basic block, and then you run to get a baseline trace of which, race, of which breakpoints get hit, and then you, like, rerun it and then do something different with the application, like send a message or push a button or whatever, and then you just see which different things get lit up, right? Like, and, and right away, you've gone from the entire, you know, ass- disassembly of the program to, like, a tiny set of functions that you have to go read and you can really quickly get a sense of the structure. And that's a simple idea, right? But like if you're looking, you know, across every application on the app store, there's like a million other things you could probably come up with to get like structural stuff. from. And that, that's before you get into the fact that you're like, you're not looking at raw assembly. Usually you're looking at the lifted assembly, which is, you know, a much higher level than the raw assembly and stuff. Like that. I just, I feel like people have this general idea that what binaries are doing is unknowable that you really need source code that source code is critical for security and like it's it's better to have source code than not have source code like yeah. i'm not i'm not making that crazy claim right but there are ways in which binary analysis is superior to source code and it's certainly not as opaque as people think it is absolutely yeah on hit tracing one of the cool things about it that a lot of people didn't realize who are thinking about it in the abstract is that once you've had the initial trace you remove those breakpoints and now that the binary runs a lot faster and a lot of people thought, oh, it's too slow. You won't be able to set breakpoints on every every basic block. Um, but once you've removed those, all you care about is if any remaining breakpoints get hit. That also goes to a, a reverse engineering process I like to apply, which is probabilistic. So you just set random breakpoints in the binary <laughs> and count how many times they get hit. It's kind of like how profiling works when you're yeah. using like Gprof or whatever. It's like you just, just randomly sample the call stack. And soon you get an idea of how the program's working, where it's spending most of its time, when you're doing certain things, where where it does those things. You know, I'm working, interacting with the UI, oh, it's in this area of the code and sending network traffic, it's in this area of the code. And so a, a lot of this stuff can be done in a kind of sloppy manner at first. And then once you know the high level of where you're looking for things, you can zoom in on the parts you care about. Okay. So what did we learn from all of this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, as far as cryptography goes, we were talking before about cryptography being brittle versus yeah. robust and how you, how you design it. And I always like to think of the different design principles that can be applied to the whole system to avoid having exploits or, or ha- avoid having additional complexity that you have to deal with. Right. And for example, consider just like a simple web cookie, HTTP cookie. <laughs> you could have one where it's 
encrypted and authenticated and you send data to the client, the client sends it back to you, you verify it before you trust the data, things like that. Or you could have a PRNG that spits out opaque IDs and you just send mm-hmm. opaque IDs to the client and you store everything on the server side in a database or wherever and you look mm-hmm. it up by opaque ID. And the latter doesn't sound very good. Like an, it has additional server resources, you know, all these things like that. But, but depending on the system and how many users you have or, or the, the characteristics of it, it may be worthwhile for the security trade-off. Yeah. Because given an opaque ID, the attacks against that are maybe a small number of attacks against that if your PRNG is weak or your entropy is bad or whatever. But, you know, if you have an encrypted and authenticated cookie, there's many, 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 many more ways that can fail. You can wrap counters <laughs> and Thomas's favorite attack. You know, you can have your side channel attacks against the key used to decrypt the cookie yep. by, by doing time, time, time attacks or whatever. There are attacks against like uh, padding Oracle attacks, you know, <laughs> like all these different things suddenly are in within scope. And now you have to know a lot more about crypto and rule out a lot more things in your design and implementation. Mm-hmm. So what, what I've always advised my clients and people I've worked with is if you can avoid crypto altogether, or maybe just PRNG or something, you know, that's way better than designing a system that has crypto and then having to verify it to the nth degree to be sure you haven't created new flaws. Mm-hmm. Or even worse, uh, building a system that is really just doing something like the database lookup, except then putting it inside of a JWT anyway, <laughs> where you're like using cryptography, <laughs> but not actually even getting any value out of it. That's something I caught in a code review once where I was like, we have a JWT here, but actually you're just using it as a lookup ID, like delete all the crypto. That's why I think all cryptographers or at least cryptographic engineers should do consulting for a while, because when you learn this stuff just from the the books or looking at implementations of things that are good, you think, you know, okay, this is kind of how to do it right. And you kind of get a sense for it, but you don't realize how bad it can be when people do it wrong. (laughs) And (laughs) and so CryptoPals is great for showing people attacks. But what's worse is like CryptoPals is like showing one type of attack against one design. Like each system only has, I think, one flaw in it, each chapter or whatever. It's not like you hit a system and it's like, it's got this flaw and this flaw and these two flaws that combine with each other to make it way more exploitable than if you only had these flaws. And every time uh, I would talk to people, people like Thomas um, saying what he had found in some system, I would just be flabbergasted because I'd just be like, why would someone even do that? Like if you asked me to come up with the worst way to use this particular (laughs) protocol or whatever, I couldn't even imagine my best imagination how to do it that poorly. So uh, it, it's, it's just astounding. So yeah, so any kind of practical experience with actually reviewing fielded systems and the things people are cooking up is much better at understanding the underlying primitives. Hmm. I would push back in this sort of new world where trying to design things with security, of course, but privacy by default really starts pushing you into a different world where like control over your data and like consent to what you do with your data, uh, where you are just a human user, probably necessitates cryptography in one way or another. We have a lot much nicer libraries to use and like kind of years of a lot less fragile constructions to use. And like a lot of people can, if you're doing messaging, you can slap Signal on it or now MLS. And like, there's a lot of things that have been kind of tried and tested in various systems. And you can slap a this on it and maybe we'll get to a world where fully homomorphic encryption makes end-to-end encrypted queries like scalable, private, and performant. But how do you feel about that sort of world where you're like, you've seen how a lot of things can go wrong, but like if we're trying to move into sort of a world where like It's not just the big Google or the big software as a service provider who just has access to everything that you ever do on their software service because that's just the way you build things. We're trying to move away from that. Um, Well, I would like to see the world move away from that. Does that make you scared or does that sort of think, do you think we're kind of in a better place that lets us able to do that in a better way than probably we used to be able to do that? I mean, I agree with you. I think that's a good thing. For example, just even providing users data export yeah, and then also making sure that the data export conforms to, first of all, all the data that the provider has on you, yeah. but also kind of the way they interpret that data gives you a better sense of what they're doing with it. And, yeah. and you don't necessarily know everything they're doing with it. It could be leaking it somewhere else or whatever. But if someone has a record that they send me back in a data export that says user ID 
and it's my social security number. And that's, that's a really bad sign, right? Like, uh-huh. that, that, like uh, they're probably sending this number all over the place and logging it all over the place. And that's uh-huh. not good. So, but any kind of visibility and transparency you can give users for how the service is thinking about the data mm. uh, or the designer of the service thought about the data is definitely good. So it can help reveal these kinds of mistakes in at least in the format. But I think cryptography is important and I'm not saying don't use it, um, mm-hmm. but just be prepared to invest the resources to do it right when you yep. do need to use it. And don't just use it because it seems cool or blockchain-y or whatever. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, JavaScript crypto is kind of one of those things where it, in the browser, where it kind of comes back to like, feel like, but it wouldn't be cool if and it's yeah. like, yeah, but you don't have the root of trust there. You know, so it would be really cool. That, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, but let's live in the real world where this actually the browser actually operates a particular way, and you know scripts are composed on the pages a particular way, and yeah. same origin and all this. And yeah, let's think more about the users and and what they're entrusting you in that system, and not how cool it would be if. Yep. But yeah, I I think it's great that, that with these new things coming on online, with being able to have uh, circles of trust, threshold cryptography is being used yeah. more for. You know, services being able to say things like, if two of my friends want to recover my data after 20 days, I'll let them or something like that. Yeah. Like those kinds of things that just didn't exist before are there. And in terms of security in general, uh, for example, on iOS, knowing that when you uninstall an app, it's actually gone. Yeah. Like this thing can no longer run. It can't leave any hooks in the system, whatever. That's that kind of capability for even just end users is is amazing to have. And I wish more systems had that kind of thing. Like when I... When I say delete my account on a particular web service, did it just mark a field in a record yeah. in a database somewhere that's going to be backed up for 10 more years? Or is it actually, <laughs> did it wipe things? And if it did it wipe it seven times with a DOD method or, <laughs> you know, did, is it on a flash drive somewhere where it just, again, in, in a, the file system just marks something unused and yeah. maybe it'll eventually get recycled. Or maybe they encrypted it to hell and they threw away the key and they they over they actually overwrote the key and it is like theoretically impossible to recover that data. So it's very hard to overwrite a key on flash generic flash storage uh, ah. in terms of uh, load balancing and stuff like that with with uh, write balancing across the different pages. Hmm. So you actually have to design carefully how the underlying hardware storing hmm. things to be sure that it's effaceable and, and you can actually when you wipe something it truly has been wiped. So again, that goes back to the dependencies. When when someone just says, oh yeah, we'll encrypt it and throw away the key. Like at what level of assurance are we yeah. saying we've thrown away the key? At what point do we know it actually has, is gone? And to what level is it gone? And I think a lot of people don't think about yeah, that. You this know? is what yeah. I think of when people say, like we're going to do a completely open Linux phone instead of an iPhone <laughs> or a flagship Android <laughs> phone for security. Because um, mm. it'll be Linux and completely transparent. And I'm like, did you do the work to make sure that you could actually efface keys? Because probably not. It's like you're you're just creating black hat talks for two years in the future if you're successful. So, and, and this comes in with like Spectre, for example. Um, yeah. With Spectre attacks, people are like, "Oh yeah, I zeroized the key in RAM," and and then it was like, "Okay, oops, my mem set was getting optimized out by the compiler because it was dead code at the end of the function." Uh-huh. Okay, so I've kept mem set in memory. Oh great, now I am zeroizing from RAM. Oh, did I zeroize it from the cache? Well, I can't talk to the cache directly. Okay, did I get rid of all the de- data dependent branches based on this that when I zeroized it? Yeah. Uh, did I clear registers even? Like, yeah. you know, I, I loaded the key. It did my mem comp that was comparing the secret to something, this timing safe man comp, let's say. So I wiped it from RAM, but did the mem comp leave the like, value, value it was comparing against in registers, general purpose yeah. registers, and the next function it returns values to the user or ha- makes them accessible if the user can save force a register save before their code runs. Yeah. I mean, it's just like so many things like that that are, when you think of all the way down to the gate level of hardware and the things that are happening there that as a designer, you have to control. It, again, if you're going to offer high assurance about it. This is why, by the way, this is why I'm such a weirdo about crypto vulnerabilities. Like, again, I'm not a, I'm not a cryptographer. I'm like a vulnerability researcher that's just kind of has a weird interest in cryptography, <laughs> but it's like, I'm obsessed with bug classes, right? Like I've mm. always been like, it's like, you know, it's much more interesting to have like the blueprint for a, a bazillion bugs than it is to have just the one yeah. bug. Right. I just, I just remember being a teenager and then working on an exploit and then finding it somewhere else and feeling like completely all powerful because I was a terrible nerd, but, um, <laughs> but like cryptography is like that, like, 
to several orders of magnitude, right? It's like, it's not enough to make sure you've counted the bytes properly. Like you have to like, you have to understand the microarchitecture and you have to understand all the different ways that attackers can influence the state of the system to bring up a pathological condition where it's like in normal, like we're still working on memory safety in normal system security, right? Like that's still yep. kind of cutting edge, <laughs> getting things built in a memory safe language, which just comes down to counting things properly, right? Like in the actual instructions that architecture and cryptography, it's like the, 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 the complexity of the constraints that you have to enforce are so much more interesting. I want to believe that we haven't even scratched the surface yet. Although if you look at the last, you know, two years or so of vulnerability research, like we're not like kicking down the doors or anything like that with, with crypto vulnerabilities. I'm like, we, we need to pick it up a bit, but um, I'm hoping to see a lot more of them. With you, that buffer overflows are, are counting things, but I think use after freeze is a much uh, bigger problem in practice and high value software and a much more complicated problem than just counting things. And possibly given the NP hardish nature of the SAT solver that gets shoved into every compiler for a type safe language <laughs> or, or memory safe language, um, probably uh, uh, in terms of computational complexity, at least kind of similar to some of the stuff we're looking at in, in crypto. I mean, what's coming next is how can you prove that your new processor is safe against a Spectre and Meltdown kinds of vulnerabilities? You know, we saw SGX fall, for example, cherry. and Intel abandoned. Yeah, Cherry is great. Uh, I like Cherry. Uh, C H E R I. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, it's 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 one of those things. So where you you start looking at the whole system again, it's, you know, system yep. on chips as well as really complex processors that are almost system on chips nowadays for yep. even desktops, and it's it's like. Which cryptographic primitives, um, you know, Dan Bernstein had a big focus on designing his cryptographic primitives to not involve data dependent branches because he's concerned yep. about timing attacks and site channel in general. Yep. But it's like um, when you're designing new cryptographic protocols and you're designing new processors that are going to run those protocols, yep. how can you do both in a way where there's a, a nice composability where <laughs> the <laughs> protocol fits well with high performance caching and branch target things, but maybe there's hints from the compiler that tell you things about what you should or shouldn't store in your buffer, your LRU yeah. or whatever. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. It'll be interesting, although I know some computer architects and they don't talk about making their, <laughs> their architectures, micro architectures or designs any nicer for building good cryptography into them. So I'm, I'm not very hopeful. And they're, they are very um, blasé about the latest and greatest microarchitectural attack. They're basically like, oh, you looked under the hood for the first time, did you? <laughs> Look at where all of your data is leaking all the time. Did you think that you got those very fast com uh, computers for free, did you? <laughs> it's scary, yeah. Yeah, it, it's scary, but at the, yeah, like... This is very interesting because like I totally believe you that like if you really want high assurance security of your software, let alone your cryptography, you basically have to nail down the piece of sand that's actually executing your operations. And I believe that thoroughly. And yet we write software that we're just like compiled to wherever, like maybe you have a, a JIT and then we're, we're expected that to, to operate over keys, like in JavaScript, for example, or WASM or whatever it is. Um, and then we might have ARM and ARM just runs everywhere. It runs on a whole bunch of devices that will execute ARM assembly. Like, are we fucked, basically? <laughs> like, is software fucked uh, if we're just trying to, to handle this as best we can in software? Or are we really, do we really need to just, like, control our hardware and everything that it runs all the way down for any sort of assurances? Uh, I'm probably not the best person to ask to answer the <laughs> first part. Uh, because I gave up on that a long time ago in terms of <laughs> trying to make the high-level stuff behave, you know, like, you know, writing Java code that translates into particular native code, which translate, you know, using, avoiding certain instructions, like, yeah. you know, you just can't prevent that kind of thing. Yeah. Even the compiler is kind of the enemy when it comes to C code. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, you know, you know, DJB does like hand coded assembly implementations of a lot of his algorithms to try to avoid stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it, it's funny. I mean, in the embedded world, you have, you're, you're much closer to the, the sand and Yet even there, there's enough complexity that you have to be very, very careful and, and do lots of testing and validation yeah. and stuff like that. 
So yeah, I, I, I don't I don't know if there's really an answer to that that of things that can be solved at the high level at, at you know at, at the complexity that that desktops and servers are. It's more like you escape to a smaller environment where you do control the sand, handle your key management, your whatever stuff there, and then the rest of it sort of you you implement compartments that are keyed off of that that that's that uh, secret state per compartment. You know, like where you yeah. have like kind kind of like an SGX type design where you've got compartments, but the key management's handled outside the processor, and the processor never has direct access to the memory encryption keys or things like that. Interesting. Can you tell me more about that? <laughs> Well, I mean, just just as just as a species, we 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 don't work well with complexity, right. and you know we have things like provable security or code verifiers and things like yeah. that to 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 check that the implementation matches the design and if the design's correct as well. Mm-hmm. Um, automated generation of code from that from the design after it's been verified, those don't work at scale. They work at small yeah. programs, and our ability to reason about the state space of an entire system is. I'm going to say, you know, to be confident, maybe it's kilobytes and megahertz and not gigahertz and terabytes. And again, that's kind of hand wavy, but, you know, it, the design and verification effort needed to to get a processor working correctly and to be in an in a environment with active attackers that are trying to influence things with physical control of the environment, like temperature yeah. and, and yeah. voltage and optical glitching and all these other things. It's 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 a it's a high threat environment. And only in the smallest scale have we been able to create something that will last for a little while. Wow. I, I will f- kind of go the other direction and be like, instead of we're all fucked unless you invest in like all this intense verification all the way down to your, you know, too smart sand and be like, most people writing software and trying to do it securely, including a lot of people writing, deploying cryptography, which is, you know, software probably don't have to worry about this sort of threat environment. But there are plenty of people who do, and they usually have more money to invest in this high assurance verification, and they might be deploying their own hardware, which they can invest trust in, right? Well, there's there's a, a problem of equity here, yeah. um, which is you've got big firms like Google that have the money to invest in both the security engineering and also the their own silicon in some cases. Uh, for like TPUs, et cetera, or Titan, for uh, for example. Um, but then you also then you have the low end people who aren't really experiencing huge threats. Their problem is more like ransomware, something that's kind of a mass scale kind of attack. And then in the middle, you have companies that have, you know, there's some kind of um, you know government contractor or something like that for yeah. air conditioning parts or whatever it is, where they actually have a high threat because they have some kind of criticality. But they oh, don't yeah. have the expertise or resources to be able to defend against that high threat. Yeah. And those, I think, are the ones that are the most, it's collectively to society, are the most risk um, groups. Because, again, they have that threat against them with highly funded, highly motivated attackers, but they don't have the inherent culture and, and support for defending themselves. Right. Huh. Okay. I think the, the running theme on some of this advice, you know, you open with saying avoid fragility, make things robust, and we've touched on limiting complexity a lot, but sometimes it's not clear what the less fragile decision is or yeah. what the less complex design is. Do you have anything you can say about what does it mean for something to actually be robust or for something to be simple versus be complex? Mm. Um, a lot of it comes from enumerating attacks and deciding which ones you don't have to care about. And usually with, with a robust design, you can throw out classes of attacks or vantage points for attacks. So for example, if you're hashing, if you've got like, you know, one master secret and you hash it with a serial number to get the drive keys in the factory for injecting into particular personal personalized devices, mm-hmm. you don't have to worry too much about someone decapping, extracting keys from a single device. Because it's like, okay, you've compromised that one device that you bought and you own. Hopefully, we don't have so much trust in the client side device in our in our overall system that that's a critical failure for the yeah. entire system. Yeah, you know we shouldn't be fielding things like that. It should be revoke that device and move on. And if you have appropriate monitoring and stuff like that to be able to do that, then you can respond and move on easily. But if someone's able to, from reverse engineering and 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 dumping a key or something from a single device, gain leverage against your entire fleet of devices or even smaller subsets of that fleet. Then you need to be more careful, uh, carefully consider that kind of attack is, is in scope. 
And also your system might be more fragile than you thought it was when you first designed it. Right. So there's 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 kind of these properties based on the the, the high level choices you make when you design it that if as you think through the attack tree and, and the various uh, bits of leverage and, and uh, approaches an attacker would take, if you keep getting confirmation that, yep, that fits within my design parameters, et cetera, that's probably a more robust design than one where, oh, wait a second. No, that as soon as they can do that, we now have to replace all this stuff. It's like, eh, maybe we should move some of that server side or n- not even collect that secret data or something yeah. like that if we can avoid it. So this is interesting because it's both threat modeling, thinking like an attacker, but also thinking in sort of like a complex systems, like sustainability, reliability sort of person or sort of architect, I guess. Yeah, you have to think through the whole life cycle. It's not what attacks can I prevent from this thing, but is the entire system survivable over the long run? You know, whether survivable is profitable or... Um, yeah, you know, some kind of lo- acceptable loss of materials or whatever it is, you know, cost of materials thrown away in the trash or whatever it is, you know, is this survivable on whatever time scale is appropriate for, for my venture, whether it's yeah. a nonprofit or for profit kind of thing. Yeah. And that survivability is including dealing things like spam and fraud yeah. and waste and abuse. And how many people are going to have to answer support phone calls yeah. when this thing goes wrong? Like, and does the user even know what to do when something goes wrong? You know? Yeah. Do I, do I call someone? Do I email them? Like, and how do we replace it in the field? Like all, all that life cycle stuff is, is critical. And again, it gets to whether a system's robust or brittle in terms Mm -hmm. of, you know, as soon as I've got a support incident of more than a thousand devices affected, uh, our company goes out of business. That's, that's not survivable. Yeah. All right. So cut, uh, branching off that, do you have any, like, like fits on a post-it design principles, like pithy words of wisdom for cryptographic systems, either at the scheme level or the like software system that you actually deploy level uh, to impart based on that sort of sort of holistic view of life cycle management. Every system has to solve the fraud problem. Cool. If it's sufficiently large, yeah. you know, and that could be, you know, everything from spam, like I said, to impersonation, to just annoyances. Yeah. You know, at some point you'll have to have some staff dealing with the support and responding to a- attacks or, or issues with it. Right. Uh, another one would be count the number of bits of state. Uh, Paul would, uh, uh, at Cryptography Research would say, count every flip flop in your system. <laughs> and, okay. you know, if you can't even enumerate all the flip flops or to be able to say something reasonable about the use of those flip-flops or, or what would happen if an attacker control can, can control one or more or a subset of these flip-flops, then probably the system is too complex to have high assurance. Yeah. So things like that. Watch out for debug access. And uh-huh. I guess in the, in the case of um, support software, this would be the console that your customer support representatives use yep. to reset passwords or whatever oh, kinds of things and, at a high level. But at the low level, it's like, you know, JTAG ports or whatever other kinds of even just board level or even on chip level yeah. wires you routed just to assist in troubleshooting a particular problem or fusing off something which is actually dangerous if it gets re-enabled watch out for debug all right well i think that's part two we've <laughs> gone on for a while um so, so thank you for coming back out nate you're uh, you're consulting again right yeah Reit Labs is is active. We're we're uh, actually doing projects. The, uh, the small audience for this uh, for this podcast, I think, intersects pretty nicely with Nate's customer base. And uh, yeah, I highly recommend people check Nate out at uh, rootlabs.com. This has been a Root Labs promotional episode, and uh, I'm happy to have done it. And don't forget to go to merch.securitycryptography, whatever, <laughs> and buy uh, a merch that is not entirely black. Yeah. It, it comes in pink now. <laughs> Nate Lawson, thank you very much. This is good. This Thanks, is great. It's been a blast. <laughs> Thanks, Nate. Security, cryptography, whatever is a side project from Deirdre Connolly, Thomas Patachik, and David Adrian. Our editor is Nettie Smith. You can find the podcast on Twitter at SCWPod and the hosts on Twitter at Durham Crushulum, at TQBF, and at David C. Adrian. You can buy merchandise at merch.securitycryptographywhatever.com. Thank you for listening.